Tonight we focus on free speech and the First Amendment, subjects that are always relevant, but all the more so now as we collectively process the events of January 6th, as we watch on the news, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene wearing face masks with the words censorship and free speech. And as we embark on an impeachment trial that focuses in great part on the power of words, I am absolutely delighted that expert Ian Rosenberg, whose new book is titled The Fight for Free Speech is here to help us understand to tease out the nuances and clarify the edges of this topic. Before introducing Ian and his conversation partner, John Donvin, let me briefly introduce myself and just say a word about the Center for Brooklyn History and BPL Presents. My name is Marcia Eli. I'm the Director of Programs at the Center, which was formerly the Brooklyn Historical Society and is now part of the Brooklyn Public Library. In addition to stewarding the most extensive collection of Brooklyn history in the world, and in addition to our research and education activities, every week the Center for Brooklyn History works through the library's programming arm, BPL Presents, to offer free public programs like this one. In the next few weeks, BPL Presents and CBH will be hosting programs with Naomi Klein, Masha Gessen, Toshi Reagan, Roxane Gay, climatologist Michael Mann, and many, many others. I so hope that you will go to the Brooklyn Public Library's website, find the BPL Presents page, and explore what's coming up. I also want to share two important notes. First, we are putting in the chat a link to purchase Ian's book, The Fight for Free Speech, locally at the Community Bookstore in Brooklyn, and I encourage you all to buy a copy. And second, I want to invite everyone to share your questions for Ian throughout the program. Simply type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Ian Rosenberg and John Donvin and tell you a brief bit about each of them. Ian Rosenberg has decades of experience as a media lawyer and has worked as legal counsel for ABC News since 2003. He graduated from Cornell Law School and began his legal career clerking uh, for a United States District Judge in Brooklyn. He is also an Emmy nominated documentary filmmaker and teaches media law at Brooklyn College. John Donvin is the co-author of In a Different Key, The Story of Autism, a New York Times bestseller and a finalist for the 2017 Pulitzer Prize. He was a multiple Emmy award-winning correspondent for ABC News for more than three decades and is the moderator of the Intelligence Squared US debate series. It's absolutely wonderful to have you both here. I cannot thank you enough. And I turn it over to you. Thank you, Marsha. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, Ian and I um, have known each other a long time. I think a little of that is going to surface, but there are certain aspects of Ian's thinking that I only discovered through this terrific book that he wrote. And I, I really do say it's a terrific book. Uh, it's uh, Ian, you, you, you write not like a lawyer. And I want to congratulate you on that. Thank um, you. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, it's meant as one. Um, and um, and as was pointed out, uh, you've been legal counsel at ABC where I worked for, for decades. Um, but there's a line in the book that I wanted to bring back to you from the very beginning. And we'll talk a little bit about what the book is about, but I wanna quote this line. You say that Chief Justice John Roberts loves the First Amendment. And I've known attorneys who, who have that love for the First Amendment. Do you love the First Amendment? Oh, uh, yes. Well, thank you, John. Uh, it's great to be here with you and the Center for Brooklyn History. And yes, uh, I do love the First Amendment. Um, I love it um, partially uh, because I do believe deeply in freedom of speech and freedom of the press, uh, and partially because uh, it has enabled me to have a career where I work for ABC News, and I'm so proud to work for the journalists uh, and work with the journalists, uh, producers, reporters, um, that help shore up our democracy every day. So I, um, I first read the book back in September in an earlier draft. 
and and realize that what you were proposing in writing this book was the idea uh, number one, that the First Amendment is a fairly complex subject, but it's incredibly relevant to our daily lives. Number two, that there are terrific stories to be told about how the First Amendment has in its own way been amended over, over the last century by the way courts have interpreted it. And number three, that even smart people don't really fully grasp what the First Amendment is about and, and its limitations and, and its powers and prerogatives that, that it delivers. And I, I wanna to go to that notion that smart people can be wrong about the First Amendment by going to something that's happening, you know, the moment that we're in right now. Um, we, just, we just saw an incident where um, Missouri Senator uh, Josh Hawley, uh, who, who was, uh, let's say at, the, at least at the periphery of what happened on January 6th here in Washington, D.C., which is where I am, by the way. Um, he, uh, he was one of the, uh, he was the first senator who wanted to uh, challenge the electoral college votes for Joe Biden. There was a photograph of him walking by the demonstrators before the breach of the Capitol happened, waving a fist to them. When that came out about Senator Hawley's position on things, um, he had a book deal in progress with Simon & Schuster. Simon & Schuster canceled the book deal, outraged at his association, perceived association with what had happened in the Capitol. And he responded, he tweeted by saying, I've got to look away for this, this is not just a contract dispute, it's a direct assault on the First Amendment. But it wasn't, was it? No, that, that's completely false. Um, and, and Josh Hawley, Senator Hawley knows better. He's a, a former clerk to Chief Justice Roberts. So he certainly understands this bedrock uh, principle of First Amendment law. That is, you know, freedom of speech does not um, incorporate freedom of reach. No one has a First Amendment right to be published um, on, by any particular publisher. My book isn't being published by Simon & Schuster. I don't have a First Amendment claim against them. Um, but, but more seriously, um, you know, believing in free speech and, and the laws um, that we have that uh, support free speech does not mean freedom from accountability. When you, when you say something, um, you have a right to say those things in, in most circumstances, but that doesn't mean you have a right um, to be shielded from consequences. Uh, and I think that's really what he's after. Um, you know, we need to be able to understand what principles of First Amendment law actually apply to our, our political discourse, uh, discourse and, and discussions and which are red herrings or just misrepresentations. And, and that's one of my goals um, with the fight for free speech is, is to start to create this user's guide so that people really do understand what is a true First Amendment claim, a true free speech claim, and, and in Hawley's case, just nonsense. So well, let's talk about that. It's not just uh, Senator Hawley. I, I, you know, very often you hear people say, um, what about my First Amendment rights when they're hushed at a meeting, uh, at a club, for example? Or, um, you know, I can't couldn't get my letter published in the newspaper. What about my First Amendment rights? That it's not just Senator Hawley. That a lot of us confuse the aspiration to and value of free speech with the First Amendment's protection of free speech. So, what's the difference? What is the First Amendment about that the rest of that is not about? Well, taking a, one step back before I answer that, I, I think it's important to understand that unlike people who clerk for the Supreme Court, um, most people um, who are clamoring for their right to speak and be heard really don't have a lot of places to turn um, to find out more about their free speech rights. There are textbooks, but that's really only if you're in law school. There are very opinionated books where people say, this is my take on the First Amendment and this is what the law should be. But I really intended uh, the fight for free speech to be a guide to non-lawyers 
Um, you know, my day job is working with smart people who aren't lawyers. When I teach at Brooklyn College, I'm working uh, with communication students um, who are not lawyers. Uh, and so this book is designed for all of these people to really have a resource to understand their rights. But then to answer your question, you know, we have to go back to the text of, of the First Amendment as a starting point. And that's one of the things I do in my book. And, and the text of the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech so, uh, or of the press. So that primarily means uh, government action. Initially, it was just federal government action. Uh, then through the incorporation doctrine, it became state action as well. So that's government entities, state entities. It can include public uh, schools and universities. But usually as a starting point, the question is, is the government involved in restricting your speech? And if not, uh, then it's unlikely you'll have a, a First Amendment right to, uh, to complain. So if you want to, if you work for a private company and um, you want to hand out leaflets or send around an email <clears throat> um, making the case for why your boss is not very smart and your boss fires you for that, you do not have a First Amendment protection against that unless your boss, unless, unless that, let me make it cleaner. You do not have a First Protection Amendment for that if it's a private company. You do not. Uh, and one of the, you know, each chapter of my book, uh, The Fight for Free Speech, I, I talk about a contemporary question um, and then I answer it with a key Supreme Court case. And, and one of the, the most burning contemporary questions that we've had in recent years is Colin Kaepernick's take a knee protests. Right. And as a starting point, I, I do have to say that the NFL as a private employer has the ability to restrict Kaepernick's speech all they want. But I also then say that we shouldn't leave the discussion there, that we're talking about free speech values. Um, and there is a key Supreme Court case that I tell the story of, of Barnett about uh, Jehovah's Witness school children, elementary school children who refused to pledge to the flag uh, during wartime, during World War II, and whose right um, to not speak was ultimately upheld by the Supreme Court, that the government can't compel you to speak a message that you don't agree with. And that also applies to public school students um, who might choose to take a knee. So yes, we have to remember that private employers have basically the right to do whatever they want to in restricting your speech, but that's not necessarily gonna be the end of the free speech conversation. So wh why, why was the First Amendment added to the Constitution? Well, I, I think that there is, a, the, the key reason is to support democracy. Um, you know, that as President Biden has said, you know, we've become very aware that our democracy is fragile. Uh, and I think that's maybe more of a new feeling today, but that was certainly the, the feeling of the framers um, and that they did believe um, very actively um, that a free press, um, a critical press, um, a, a press that was in the thorn in the side of um, of government um, was vital to revolution and was vital to uh, the continuation of the United States um, as, as they hoped it would um, live and thrive. Um, so, you know, yes, um, I think at its core, the First Amendment was created initially to protect political speech um, and as a function of democracy. But as I talk about um, in these cases that, um, you know, George Carlin, uh, even if his message uh, isn't political, uh, should have a, a free speech right too. And that's an, another one of the chapters. In my I, I want to let everybody know that we'd like you to participate in the conversation by asking questions and you can submit them uh, on the screen there, uh, going through the chat box. And um, we're not going to get to them right away, but if you want to start formulating questions or if something occurs to you, you can start submitting at this point. Um, so Ian, you, ju you just did the thing that, that lawyers do, which is you shorthanded a whole lot of history and story and narrative into the term Barnett, which is half of the name of a case. Uh, and lawyers will throw around Barnett and, and you guys all know what that means and what that implies and what that refers to. But what I like what you do in the book is that you went in the opposite direction and you, you really kind of teased out the stories of the people who were involved in these cases and what they were like and what the stakes were for them and the things that they that they went through. And so it stops being abstract and, and just a name. I, I wanna read a scene very briefly uh, that really impressed me. You, One of the cases you look at 
is um, the case of uh, um, Jerry Falwell sued Larry Flint. Jerry Falwell was the founder of the Moral Majority, an uh, evangelical preacher and uh, political figure. Larry Fl Flint was the pornographer and publisher of Hustler magazine. Flint had created a mock uh, Campari ad uh, in which uh, he created a, a very, very sexually explicit monologue, supposedly in the head of uh, Jerry Falwell. And, um, and, and it was, Falwell was really upset. It was very, uh, 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 it was rather insulting to him. And, um, and, th and Flint's position it's was, well, it was- accused a, of having sex with his- With his mother. Sorry, I was gonna say, he was accused of having sex with his mother in an outhouse. So yeah, it's, it's understandable that yeah, he was I, I didn't know if I could say that at yeah. the Brooklyn Public Library. So I was holding off on that. Um, That's the uh, tamer version, actually. Yeah, it is. Um, and, uh, um, but you wrote a scene when they actually met up in the Supreme Court, because this thing went to the Supreme Court. All the cases in the book end up in the Supreme Court. And another thing you do is you talk about a lot of who the justices are. Flint entered through a side entrance and was rolled to within 20 feet of where Falwell sat with his wife. Flint was dressed the part of a respectful participant in a three-piece suit with a red tie and his curly red hair slicked back. Falwell, beaming paternalism, had on a red and white striped tie with his feathery gray hair neatly coiffed. Both men had confident smiles that day. There's a lot of visual detail in there, which, uh, which I want to say is a tribute to the way that you wrote this book. But did I just want to very briefly go through process. Did you Were you there or how did you... Uh, uh, no, well, well, thank you for bringing it up. It, it is one of my favorite cases. Um, and, you know, I said that he has a confident smile because Falwell um, was sure that he was doing a good and that Flint was sure that he was up to no good. Um, so uh, I, that, that's my interpretation. Um, no, I was, uh, I was like a teenager when that case happened. So I, I wasn't in the Supreme Court, um, but uh, I, you know, there's a great ABC News report um, where you see uh, Flint and Falwell um, coming out of the courtroom, so I, I knew um, what you could, uh, what they looked like, um, and also I, uh, you know, the two biographies I never would have thought I would uh, pour over um, in incredible detail would be Larry Flint's and Jerry Falwell's, um, and so uh, I learned a lot from their own descriptions of their experiences in the courtroom, because even for these two titanic figures arguing before the Supreme Court, where uh, Flint had once before been uh, physically ejected from the Supreme Court in another great side story, um, uh, it's, it's memorable even for them. And um, as you point out, one of the things I'm really trying to do in this book, uh, you know, in law school, all you hear about, as you say, is the case name and the rule, uh, maybe a little bit about interpretation. But to me, the fascinating part of these stories are the, the stories of the, these pioneers and their struggles. Um, and uh, I think these are stories that should be shared beyond the legal world. And they really tell us a lot about the meaning of America. And when you know their stories, uh, and then the stories that the Supreme Court are, the justices are, are telling us through their decisions, that's another way of understanding the story of, of America. And as Thurgood Marshall, Justice Marshall says, you know, this is a living document. And we really see how both our constitution lives um, and our country lives through these stories of these uh, First Amendment pioneers. So, so that is what this book ends up doing, exactly what you laid out. That's why I wanted to share that paragraph to sort of suggest the texture that you go to. So now let's get, while, while you're visiting the more esoteric ideas, so let's get to a place where this esoteric idea meets story. Very beginning of the book, the very first chapter, uh, you're, it, Abrams, it's the Abrams case is the yes. shorthand. There's a whole story of who Abrams was and who, uh, what Abrams did, but also what Abrams colleagues did, comrades yeah. did, let me put it that way. Yeah. And, and what was really interesting to me is how, what it illustrates in part is how recently First Amendment jurisprudence really began. There really was no attention paid by the Supreme Court to the, to the uh, First Amendment for the first 130 years or so. Then it's World War I, Abrams, and you particularly focus on uh, Molly Steimer was another person in that case you seem really, really taken with this character, Molly Steimer. So tell the story of Molly Steimer and then tell us why you're telling us now. Well, 
so I do fo focus on Molly Steimer rather than uh, Jacob Abrams, um, partially because I think she's an unsung or undersung feminist hero um, and, and just really has an incredible story. She came to um, New York um, at 16, fleeing anti-Semitic persecution and pogroms in, uh, in Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, and she became radicalized by how hard her life was trying to support um, her parents and, and her extended family. She was a seamstress. Um, and, you know, we sort of glamorize, I think, that time period. It was really hard for people. And she became an anarchist, uh, opposed World War I, um, but specifically opposed uh, US involvement um, in, on the Russian front, which she and many people in retrospect believe was really just an effort to thwart the, rough, the Russian revolution. So she's hanging out with these anarchist friends of hers. They have a printing press uh, and they print out two leaflets, one in Yiddish, one in English, um, and both of them condemn the war and uh, particularly um, condemn the involvement in Russia. And she literally throws them um, from rooftops and out of bathrooms on the Lower East Side. I'm here on the Lower East Side right now, just a couple blocks away. Um, is where she's throwing out these pamphlets and they caused a sensation. Um, they were all arrested and they were all uh, convicted um, 20 years and 15 years for her, out of sexist notion because she was a woman. Um, and, uh, and, and their convictions are upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, they are convicted for criticizing the government for what at the time was considered advocacy of illegal action. Uh, and, and our modern notion, as you say, of free speech comes not from that decision that uh, upheld their convictions, that affirmed their convictions, but instead from a dissent from Justice Holmes, um, joined by his friend, um, Justice Brandeis, where he created the notion of the marketplace of ideas and, and really created our modern understanding uh, of free speech law. Um, and then, um, you know, the story goes on. Uh, I tell it because it tells us um, what about uh, why, for example, I begin the chapter with Madonna at the Women's March saying that she sometimes thought about blowing up the White House. And then she goes on to say I'm, uh, you know, that I believe in love, not hate. But, but that kind of uh, advocacy of illegal action um, you know, would have shocked Molly Steimer, um, not, not, not what she said, but it would shock Molly Steimer that Madonna wasn't arrested. And, and there were some people who called for her arrest. So I, I, I begin with the story at the Women's March to say that our modern protest movements are really based on the rights that were created because of this woman named Molly Steimer. So um, if, and, if Molly Steimer had to serve the time because the decision went against her, and it was only in the dissenting opinion that the term marketplace of ideas as something that should be cherished and protected was raised. How does, it, how does the idea of the, 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 an opinion from the losing side end up having influence in the longer term? Uh, that's important, and that's one of the I, that's one of the themes that I sh I'm hoping to try and weave throughout the book. You know, I think there's been a lot of attention of, about uh, the wonderful dissents of Justice Ginsburg and, and how galvanizing they um, they had been. Um, but it's also, you know, the point of a dissent is uh, just to remind people it's the opinion of a justice um, who is not on the winning side, who is not in the majority, um, who disagrees with both the reason and the result of their other justices. Um, and, and these expressions of, of disagreement sometimes are just that, but sometimes they end up actually changing the law and, and become so powerful and such a clarion call for future justices and, and future times that they, they cr create new law. And, and it really is Justice Holmes' decision that not only creates our modern conception of free speech and our right to criticize the government and our right to participate at the Women's March or Black Lives Matter protests, but it also led to um, the incitement standard that I did not know would be so relevant, but um, uh, is you know uh, at the core of uh, our impeachment proceedings today. I mean, another another thing that emerges from that story and from the book overall is the enormous power this small number of people in robes who have mostly been men in robes for a very long time have over our lives to to say this th this this can go and this can't go, and that they get to as an institution get to change their minds. Over, over time. 
So Molly Steimer came along at the wrong time to be able to throw those leaflets off the building and uh, paid for it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier that, you know, freedom of speech, you know, in her case, she, her free speech rights weren't vindicated until later. But, but many of the people who um, I portray who actually win um, their cases before the court really, you know, suffered enormous consequences um, um, through the course of fighting for their rights. Um, I mean, I talk about Mary Beth Tinker, an elementary stu school student uh, in Iowa during the Vietnam War, uh, back when uh, it was initially still very popular in this country. She wore a black armband to post uh, to uh, protest the war, was suspended from school for doing so, ultimately wins the right um, to protest, it creates a, a brand new recognition of student speech rights, uh, the phrase that you don't give up your free speech rights uh, as you pass through the schoolhouse gate is one of the loveliest metaphors um, of, of First Amendment law. But, you know, she suffered, um, you know, uh, embarrassment, she suffered death threats, her family um, uh, was um, plagued by um, her community. Um, there is no guarantee that when you uh, fight for your free speech rights that you are going to be embraced. And in fact, most of that just happens in retrospect. So when we look at a, you know, a previously controversial uh, figure like, say, Colin Kaepernick or something, and sometimes says, oh, some people say, oh, you're unpopular. So what you must be doing, uh, your message must be wrong. Uh, I'm using this book to hopefully remind people that most of the time people speaking out for their rights um, are are viewed negatively at the time of their protest. Okay, Ian, if it's okay with you and it's okay with everyone in the audience, I wanna break the format a little bit. Uh, so we were going to talk for quite a while and then take some questions at the end, but I'm actually seeing some interesting questions coming in now. So I have the conversation that I wanna do with you mapped out, but I'd like to break away from it to get some of these questions in and then we can return. Are you good with that? Sure, of course. All right, so um, some of it reflects on things that you've said already. Um, uh, Jordan asks, Jordan makes a comment, but let's make it a question. My understanding is that at the time that the First Amendment was passed, that many people did not think the Bill of Rights was needed, including the First Amendment. Uh, that that is correct. Um, right. The, the, the tension was between do we want to sort of list out our rights um, and therefore shore them up or by listing them, are we going to have to worry that we're going to leave some out and then future um, administrations, generally uh, perceived to be future um, executive powers, um, would um, you know say too late? You have you have listed all the rights that you have, um, and you, that you can't uh, ask for any more. Um, that is not um, you know that I'm glad the, um, the Bill of Rights uh, contingent yeah. went out, um, and and we. I, I discussed the sort of evolving nature of, um, of free speech law, but also sort of, you know, looking at originalist thought, um, what did the framers intend to um, also the, the more living constitution, Thurgood Marshall, uh, Ginsburg approach of, you know, the framers aren't the only thing. We need to also talk right. about evolving notions. of liberty. Jordan, thank you. That got us to an interesting place. Um, I want to return then to, to the narrative, to, to your uh, talking about cases from the past and their relevance for the future. The Westboro Church case, take us through that and what happened there and what we learned from it. And again, you tell in a very personal way about the people who were involved. Uh, thank you. So yeah, so we're so when we're talking about hate speech uh, and the contemporary question I begin with is, is the Nazis marching in Charlottesville. Um, but but we can bring up any sort of uh, example of, of, of hate speech to, to frame it. Um, I, I then say that the court's most significant and, and recent treatment of hate speech um, is in the Westboro Baptist Church case. Um, and, and people misunderstand and, and will sometimes say, um, you know, free speech does not include hate speech. And this case um, explains that in the Supreme Court's view, uh, yes, that free speech does include hate speech. So it's hard to think of more hateful speech than the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, they were basically just a family, um, but a small church that, um, among other things, would protest outside of military funerals, particularly Iraq and Afghanistan um, veteran funerals. Um, and would uh, hold up signs. Uh, I won't say exactly what they said, but they attack 
uh, the United States support, their perceived um, support uh, in the US for homosexuality and said that because of that, this, uh, any deaths in, uh, in foreign wars um, or foreign conflicts were you know, God's punishment on all of us. Um, so, um, you know, they would say things like, you know, God loves dead soldiers and much, much worse. Um, and so they protested outside of a particular, they did this hundreds of times, but outside of a particular military funeral, um, Matthew uh, um, Snyder, and um, they were on public land, not interfering with the actual funeral, but right there. Uh, and when the father um, who was burying his son, um, his limo was driving up, the limo driver to the church, his Catholic church where um, they worshiped, um, the driver took a back entrance to uh, try and avoid um, the father seeing these signs, but he later saw them on television. And he says, I'm not gonna take this. Um, I'm going to sue them for emotional distress uh, and bring this case ultimately to the Supreme Court. And, and what the court held is that Justice Roberts, um, you know, once again, who, who styles himself as a champion of, of free speech law, and in this case he was, um, says, uh, we cannot um, punish the speaker because of how much we hate the message. Uh, that these people were in a public place, they didn't directly interfere with the funeral. No matter how hateful their words are, we have to allow them to speak. Um, and, you know, what's this is a difficult, this is, I think, the most difficult area in First Amendment law. Um, and, and I don't think that we need to necessarily accept this as, um, we have to accept that this is the way the court views it, but I don't think this necessarily means that it's the right answer. Right. Um, but one of the interesting twists, I'll reveal the twist of the case, um, one of the interesting twists is although Snyder um, was devastated when he lost before the Supreme Court and this monetary judgment he had won against the church um, uh, disappeared, um, he says that over time, he learned um, that for him, his son died in large part fighting for freedom of speech, even for people who were so hateful as to protest at his funeral. So through the power of free speech, his opinion changed. And another woman who I profile, one of the family members of the uh, Westboro Baptist Church, who um, was like their sort of lead social media person. It was Megan Phelps Roper, right? Exactly, Megan Phelps yeah. Roper. She becomes um, transformed through the power of free speech. Also, she was celebrating all these hateful things and celebrating their victory in the most disgusting way possible. Um, and then people on Twitter uh, actually tried to respectfully argue and disagree with her. She, mm -hmm. she chose to change her views, left her family. And so we have the two sides of, uh, of this battle actually changing their minds because of the power of free speech. It, so, it's so, really so remarkable. That's like a around. perfect example of the ideal example of what was meant by the marketplace of ideas. That if, yeah. that if, if one of those views viewpoints had been suppressed, then those transformations wouldn't have happened. So Margaret Phelps Roper, who was spewing this homophobic stuff outside the funeral of a, in fact, the dad was gay also, wasn't he? Yes, and no one knew that um, yeah. because the, the Westboro church would always just attack um, gay people, okay. so, soldiers that were not gay, um, but he, um, out to his family, but not um, not in public. So it was even more painful. All right. So his son's his son is dead. He's burying his son outside. He can hear these chants, these signs that are homophobic. And one of the women holding up these signs later, because of the marketplace of ideas and conversations on Twitter, changes her views. So that's like the ideal version of it. Yeah. You point out something early on in the book, a problem with the marketplace of ideas, a critique that has actually been brought now is that it's the argument that not everybody really has um equal access to that marketplace that it's that it's not it's not enough to just say everybody should be able to say what they want vis-a-vis -vis the government and because it because the power differentials are different and you don't go into that in depth but you do note it i want to talk with you about why you bring that into the conversation well i, I think that for too long um many champions of the First Amendment, and I would be honored to, to be considered uh, among those uh, people, um, have been too um, cavalier about describing how wonderful the marketplace of ideas is. It's a great metaphor, um, but what they are ignoring and what has been pointed out for years by critical race theorists and, and other equity theorists uh, is that 
Well, that's all, all well and good, but who's allowed access to the market? For the longest time, Black people and women had zero access to the market. Um, and, um, and, you know, Catherine McKinnon um, is a, a feminist legal scholar who says, you know, does, does the speech of Nazis um, make um, the speech of Jews more fulsome? Does the speech of pornographers help the speech of women? I think not, basically. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. She's more eloquent. Um, and I, I do not think that we can ignore um, critical race theorists like uh, Kimberly uh, Crenshaw, Marie uh, Matsuda, others, um, and I do reference them in the book, um, because we have to realize that there are limits um, to the power of these metaphors. And, and sometimes the metaphors may fail, but um, the point I want to make um, with the marketplace of ideas and in general with these stories from the past is that we can't argue for new changes, for new metaphors, until we know what the framework is for basically all of our free speech discussion. And, and the marketplace of ideas, I use it for chapter one because it is the starting point, however flawed, for understanding everything else that goes forward in First Amendment law. We have a question from... Um... Alec. Hi, Ian. I'm not sure this goes to First Amendment interpretation, but I'm curious about it anyway. Is there any way to argue that Facebook and Twitter exercise so much power as a fora for discourse that their executives should match government grade free speech standards? Separately, would you argue that they're more or less doing so anyway? Uh, well, so that's, I, I think, you know, sort of, yeah. yeah, it's a great question. And, um, and you know, I think there's a clear answer. Um, one of the things I try and do in this book. My father was an economist, and he always said that you know Truman. I think once asked, he wanted a one-handed economist, so not somebody who says on the one hand this and on the other hand that. So I'm going to be a one-handed lawyer here and say that um, the the answer is: Can Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube can they go so far as to deplatform the president of the United States, the former president of the United States? Um, you know, why are they allowed to do that? And that goes back to what we were discussing earlier. They are private actors. They do not need to abide by the First Amendment. Um, they can restrict speech all they want. They can, um, they can take, choose to not uh, allow ads on their platform. They can edit the speech of people on their platform. Um, there is no First Amendment question here in terms of would their uh, actions ever be found to be uh, unconstitutional. They are absolutely within their rights uh, from a free speech and First Amendment perspective. However, again, um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be lobbying for, um, I begin the chapter um, with talking about Sasha Baron Cohen's um, attack on what he calls the Silicon Six, the leader of social media, the leaders of social media companies. I talk about the, the horrible hate speech that's um, uh, been um, propagated online against people like Lindy West and, and Leslie Jones, the comedian. Um, so I don't mean that we give up and throw up uh, our hands in the air and say there's nothing that can be done. I'm just saying that the First Amendment is not the tool for, um, for change and is not the tool for um, effective uh, protections right. online. I think the second part of the question that was sort of suggesting that these companies, these executives could adopt First Amendment-ish approaches to how speech would be governed on their platforms. Well, yes, so, but that, but First Amendment-ish. So, like, what does that mean? And and that's the that's the yes. rub. Um, I think it's a good thing that um, that you know violence um, and um, extreme forms of hate speech can be um, deplatformed or be can can be removed. Um, I would say they're acting in community interests in that regard, perhaps but more than a free speech interest. A strict free speech or First Amendment approach would say marketplace of ideas, the only solution for bad speech is more speech, totally hands off. That was what Zuckerberg had said for the longest time. Um, and I think the sort of newer approach that they're taking, which they are allowed to take because they are not the government and they are not government actors, um, where they actually are policing against violence um, and hate speech is a good thing and is uh, the right political and social goal um, and effort. Um, it's just not a First Amendment effort, in my opinion. So you've made it clear that the First Amendment applies when it's the government that's the state action is suppressing, restricting, impinging on the free speech. But I, I was puzzled by your including the case of Larry Flint and Jerry Falwell. 
because Jerry Falwell was attempting to restrict um, restrict um, um, Larry Flint's speech by suing him for damages, which would have negative effect on his ability to speak or punish him for speech he had done. Where's the state actor in that? I, I don't see why the court would would get involved in that. So where is the state action? Uh, there is no state action is, is the short answer to your question. And, and, and saying like, is the company a private actor um, is, is a shorthand for most of the time addressing all the issues that we need to know, but not always. Um, and I do bring up uh, the Flint case and, and I bring up the, the foundational case of, of New York Times versus Sullivan where a civil rights um, ad, a pro-civil rights ad um, supporting Dr. King um, was sued over by Southern authorities. They tried to bankrupt uh, the Times uh, as well as um, civil rights defendants. Um, and there's no state action there. There is a, a government actor, but he's, he's suing in a private capacity. Um, and, and the Supreme Court, uh, well, this is not exactly clear, but, but in, in the doctrine, but I, I hope I streamline it in the book, the Supreme Court will sometimes step in when other um, private individuals are using litigation to suppress our free speech rights. So in the case of the, uh, of the Southern libel lawsuits against the Times, they didn't really care about their reputation. They were rabid segregationists and, and racists. Their reputation was enhanced by being criticized um, in their communities um, by uh, Dr. King and others. Um, they were trying to thwart um, the Times from covering the civil rights movement. Um, and uh, I would argue that Jerry Falwell, although he might have had actual hurt feelings, um, he was used um, his lawsuit as a fundraising device um, and, uh, and also was trying, had been dedicated to trying to put pornographers uh, out of business because of uh, his view of moral reasons. So in both of those cases, the court steps in and says, wait a second, what these individual actors are doing using established laws that previously didn't have a constitutional First Amendment sort of connection, we realize that, that this is really going to chill speech if this continues, and we're going to step in and create a new standard. Could there could there be an analogy for Twitter's decision to shut people down because of things that they're saying in terms of, especially in terms of hate speech? Could could this could you see the Supreme Court finding a way to saying uh, Twitter's business is our business? Uh, people have made that argument, uh, scholars and advocates. Um, I, I don't think there's any hope of it uh, prevailing in, in the in the immediate future. Um, in the in the fight for free speech, I talk. We go all the way up to the present, um, and I talk about the Supreme Court's only significant treatment uh, of social media speech. It's a case called Packingham, um, and in that case, a sex offender was restricted by North Carolina from having any access uh, to social media and Justice Kennedy in a very rousing um, opinion talking about how the virtues of uh, uh, of social media and how it, it you know sort of transforms every town crier into a, a an internet universal megaphone um, and he says that our, our use of social media um, is a vital component of contemporary uh, speech. Um, so if in those kind of cases, in that kind of case where, you know, a, a very negative actor, a sex offender, um, a, a state law restricting only the, the social media speech of certain people, the court made very clear that they wanted no part of that. Um, it was unanimous decision, um, sorry, uh, one dissent, but um, in the, the court um, is not going to be um, the vehicle in, in the near future for changing our social media laws. Okay. Um, that's why I say we need to be able to understand what our rights are in that connection and then um, move in other directions for, for lobbying for change. I, I, I have three questions that I think yeah. can be very quick hit questions. So, so we'll go one, two, three. Um, again, from Jordan, what case was it that adopted Holmes' opinion on the mar marketplace of ideas? Uh, Abrams. Um, a Abrams versus U.S. He spelled it out in Abrams, but I think the question is, when did it start to be, have influence? What oh, oh, um, so that, oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, years, <laughs> it, it took years. Um, um, you know, so one of the things I try and do uh, in the book 
um, is I, I, I wanted to pick 10 cases that can really distill our rights down to their essence. Um, but the real process of law uh, takes a lot more time um, and, and builds case upon case upon case. Okay. Um, that's um, why I, I present the All right. I'm going, to accept, I'm going to accept that as the answer so that okay. we yeah. move on to another question. Susan asks, do the laws governing the right of free speech also give one the right to spread false inflammatory lies? Yes. Uh, this is counterintuitive, but the Supreme Court has held that um, that there is a First Amendment free speech right to lie. Uh, this is in the, what are called the Stolen Valor case. Um, the Congress tried to pass a law that said you couldn't lie about your military service uh, or your lack of, you couldn't claim to be, um, ha have been in the military or have won a, a military award um, uh, or medal if you hadn't. Uh, and the court um, held that there is a First Amendment right to lie. A and this is, understandably very troubling, um, but the reason for it is who decides. If, um, if we are going to start policing truth and lies, I think you know liberals in this country wouldn't have wanted um, that to uh, be coming from the government over the last four years of the Trump administration, and perhaps conservatives um, wouldn't want that um, in our current um, Biden administration. So um, yes, you have a free speech right to lie. But not under oath. But not under oath. And not talking to the FBI, I think, correct? Am I wrong about that? So, uh, that's a criminal law, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, you, I think you can be charged with lying to the FBI if it's part of an investigation, not just if you're- All right, Dwayne has a question. This, for coffee. Dwayne's question is not gonna be a quick hit question. It's gonna it's go, go a little bit deeper. You mentioned early on that the first amendment early on only applied to the federal government. It was the Reconstruction Amendments, in particular the 14th, that applied the First Amendment to the states, as you covered. Here's the question. As a result, do you think that the First Amendment, as applied to the states, should be read through the 14th? In other words, should equal protection principles, at times, trump First Amendment principles, considering the first would not apply to the states today otherwise without the 14th? Uh, that is, um, that's a really good question. Uh, okay. So my short answer is yes, we absolutely have to read the First Amendment through the 14th, um, because otherwise it wouldn't apply to the states. And um, from a theoretical perspective, I do agree that equity concerns um, are, are sort of undervalued um, in the First Amendment context. And that is sometimes um, the court sort of thinks in silos, they sort of think equity here, First Amendment there. Um, and, and I bring up, you know, that in some great free speech victories, um, in the case of New York Times versus Sullivan, which gave us our current libel uh, laws that are greatly protect the press, um, you know, this happened in, in a trial that was in a segregated courtroom in which the, with an all white jury in which the rights of the black defendants, uh, minister defendants who were civil rights leaders um, were thoroughly trampled on. Uh, and that was ignored by the court. Um, so yes, um, we need to focus more on equity, but I also personally do believe that free speech has led about um, e equitable change for the better through protest movements throughout our history. Here's a question that I know from prior conversations with you, you are going to love. Can we please retire the crying fire in a crowded theater line? <laughs> Many uh, people omit the word falsely. Ah, Number two, oh, this, Holmes was in love with clever epigrams as a substitute for rigorous analysis. The defendant's conduct in Schenck, in which this slogan arose, was far removed from the violence caused by a panic in the theater. I know that you are really tired of, of, of the lines being misused, I think. Yes. So uh, I do, I say, if you get nothing else from my book, um, this is the one thing I want people to, to go forward and, and cite correctly. Um, and, and so you can, if you get nothing else from this talk. So Holmes said in Schenck, this guy uh, really knows, uh, or, or woman really knows their, um, their law. Uh, in this case that led, that was right before uh, Abrams, um, Holmes said, you know, of course, um, there is um, no restriction, uh, of course, there would be no First Amendment concern about crying fire in a uh, crying <laughs> fire falsely in a crowded theater and causing a panic. So whatever, whenever anyone wants to restrict speech, they say, oh, well, we can, you know, you can't cry fire. Um, and no, of course you can cry fire in a crowded theater. Um, there might be smoke. We should give people a medal for um, uh, crying fire in a crowded theater if it's accurate. Um, so the first um, thing that we always need to think about if we're wanting to 
think about speech, even though it's not enough. I said that you can lie and get away with it. But the first thing we need to think about it is, um, is there falsity? And then the second thing that almost nobody remembers from that statement is, and cause a panic. You know, if you're in a theater and you say, oh my God, I smell smoke. And then somebody says, no, 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 that's just, you know, dry eyes. It's for the, the, the stage effect in act two. And, and nobody does anything, of course you shouldn't be punished for that. If you see something, you should say something. So um, the, the true quote is, you can't cry fire falsely in a crowded theater and cause a panic. Um, you know, definitely go forth and flaunt that knowledge, um, everyone listening. Colin asks, could you please clarify the extent to which hate speech is protected by the First Amendment? Does it mean that under the First Amendment, there cannot be consequences for expressing any idea? Well, uh, so yes, um, yes, uh, hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. So that's why Nazis uh, can say, you know, uh, in Charlottesville can say Jews will not replace us um, and, and can say much more vicious things um, than that. Um, um, but the second part of the question, uh, sorry, what is the, the second part of the question again? Does it, but does it basic, I'm going back to it, I'm sorry, does it mean that there cannot be consequences for expressing any idea? In other words, it's, right, right. can any idea fly? So um, I, I firmly believe that we should um, that we should have consequences for people saying hateful things. Um, and, and in fact, you know, it's, it's, people sometimes uh, use the term cancel culture in, in a very negative way. But um, but we should be trying to um, cancel out um, uh, hateful, um, racist, um, anti-Semitic, uh, homophobic um, types of statements. But we should be doing it with more speech. Um, if you're talking about um, can that be criminalized, uh, the question is, the answer is right now you cannot. Uh, if you disagree with that strongly, then I, I would say um, I, I, I'm sympathetic um, and uh, read my book. Um, you'll then have the tools to advocate um, uh, for the change that you believe in. Which I want to remind people is called the fight for free speech. Um, Harriet is asking, are he said, she said kinds of disagreements connected to freedom of speech concerns? If each party in a dispute has the right to speak, is some particular evidence required to prove one to be truthful, accurate, and even accountable for what they are communicating? I'm not, I'm not sure we're in a First Amendment territory on that question. That's right. That, that, that's really a criminal law um, context. You know, so much of what we, we do in life is speech. Um, and, and, and that does not mean that everything that involves speech, uh, you know, as you were saying, you can't lie under oath. Um, there, are, there are definitely limits uh, on speech. Um, but what I try and do in the fight for free speech is to clarify the 10 rights that we have um, as, as, you know, uh, members of this country. Um, and then, um, you know, I think that creates a framework for understanding when people just bring up the First Amendment um, as a sort of red herring. So I, I had just turned to the page. Uh, it's page 197. It's your, it's, it's, it's actually, but 197 means it's not a long read, by the way. It's very <laughs> bite-sized, um, which is another reason that I like it. Uh, on page 197, you actually do an afterword and you say, okay, here's what it all boils down to. You have, yeah. as a result of the cases descri described in the book, and the judges, decisions made by these individual judges over time who got to change their mind, who are dealing with the lives of real people who are living with real things and real consequences. As a result of all of that process, we now have the 10 following rights, you say, at the end of the book in one list, the right to advocate for illegal action. So you can advocate for stuff that you can say, let's do this, even if the this is wrong. As long as it, as long as it doesn't cause imminent likely harm. Yes. Okay. You have that's the right it, not to the speak. Maximum. You have the right not to speak. Correct. Which that's comes correct. out of the not having to say the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm presuming. That's right. Or take a knee, in my opinion. You have the right to criticize public figures and to be wrong, to, be, to make mistakes while doing so. So they can't sue you on the little stuff for getting That's the right. You're not allowed uh, to have uh, knowing falsehoods or reckless disregard for the truth. So the Trump line that the press can lie and get away with it is false, but you are allowed to make small mis reasonable mistakes. The right to non-disruptive protest in school. That's Mary Beth Tinker and her armband. Um, and you are absolutely uh, allowed um, to express your free speech views in a classroom. The right to offend. Yeah, I, I talk about um, how Julie Briskman, who's um, the woman who uh, flipped her middle finger up at Trump's motorcade, um, 
and uh, then got uh, caught uh, in a great photo, um, lost her job. Her private employer um, is allowed to fire her. Um, but, um, but there is a right uh, to offend. And I, I go back um, to a case where I, I won't say the curse word, but somebody said F the draft um, explicitly on the, their jacket during uh, the Vietnam War. Um, and, and their right to offend um, was upheld by the court because they said in another beautiful phrase, one man's vulgarity is another man's lyric. All right, the, uh, the right to publish without being stopped. That's the Pentagon Papers case, and that's you know um, the New York Times um, publishing the secret um, Vietnam uh, history that was leaked by Daniel Ellsberg. Um, you know, it was a, today we sort of take for granted that uh, the press has the right to publish these things, but it was a very close case, and I think the most exciting First Amendment battle. Um, it, it, and here's a right you list that we do not have. We do not have the right to curse on broadcast television and radio, which is why we still hear bleeping. That is that is right. Um, that's uh, I made a reference to George Carlin's Seven Dirty Words, uh, and that monologue was the basis of a complaint um, and the FCC regulation that went up to the Supreme Court, and uh, the court held that the FCC on cable, excuse me, on broadcast uh, television and radio can restrict, um, not censor, but can restrict the words we say, even um, uh, even if they're fleeting. The right to parody. Yeah, so that's the Falwell Flint case that we talked about, um, where they defended uh, Flint's right um, to have this vicious parody of Jerry Falwell, in large part because they said it was needed to give breathing space to political cartoonists and other sort of political satirists. You, you can imagine that the person who who is being parodied can, you know, that that can seem incredibly unfair and and painful. Um, you know, some really horrible imagery and caricature can be done. And, well, and, but it's and, legal. Yes, it, that's legal. And, um, and you know, we begin, I, I begin that chapter um, talking about how Trump says, how can SNL get away with this hit job? There should be revengeance, um, uh, I think he said, um, uh, against SNL. Um, but the test can't be, I, I think I explained in the chapter that the test should not be the, um, whether or not there were real hurt feelings. Um, no one really believed that Falwell was, was lying, that he had hurt feelings about the vicious said, uh, things said about his mother. The, the question is, how can, you, um, how can you judge just based on feelings? We, we need to create the freedom to, to parody and not have intent be the standard. The right to espouse thought we hate. That's hate speech. Um, and yes, there is, it is um, the, the court believes necessary to uh, enable our discourse um, where we don't punish the speaker. S sometimes the thought we hate um, are, are things that we will all condemn today, but in the past it was also anarchists and civil rights defendants. And finally, the right to use social media as a public forum. You know, that's the this last case that I talk about that says that um, the court is going to be extremely reluctant um, to uh, uphold any type of state or federal restrictions on our right to use social media. It, it, it seems in, in all of these cases that all of us are kind of instinctively in support of free speech when it's our speech. And we get, we're more sympathetic to shutting down speech when it's somebody else's speech that we don't like. That 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 that's not. This is not just about what the courts are deciding. That there's something in all of us. That's there's a tension in all of us over this this issue. Can well, you talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So you know, I mean, one of the um, one of the most eloquent um, uh, justices on the court, Justice Jackson, um, uh, he talked about in, in the case that gave the right not to speak the the Barnett case of these Jehovah's Witness school children who wanted not to pledge to the flag. Uh, he says that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says that, um, you know, this right is, is, is difficult, um, not because um, it's unimportant, but because it's so important um, that, that people's feelings about, about the flag um, and about patriotism uh, are difficult because we may fundamentally disagree with them. Um, and, and he says, but that is what that is the fixed star in our constitutional firmament, that there is no orthodoxy that is prescribed or allowed to be um, prescribed by our, our government. That when we were fighting the fascists in World War II, we had to remember 
that even though um, somebody might be doing something that is perceived as un-American, that the right to say that is, is uniquely American. What, what is your thinking on where we're going? What's, what's going to be the next big thorny First Amendment type of, I don't mean specific case, but I mean type of issue that we're going to be facing? Well, I mean, I think there's two. I, I think it's hate speech and social media, and, and in fact, the, the confluence of them. I mean, the future of um, of speech is, is clearly going to be online. And, and what's remarkable is that the court didn't even address uh, social media um, and in a free speech context uh, until this Packingham case in 2017. So, so this book, The Fight for Free Speech, brings you really close to uh, up to our, our present day. Um, and, um, and we need um, a framework for deciding new and novel uh, you know, free speech issues. And one of the things I say in my book is that we shouldn't be necessarily wedded to the stories of the past, but we need to know about them and understand them before we can chart our, chart our free speech future. And again, I just want to point out, you make it really human. I mean, the book includes, for example, whatever happened to those kids who didn't say the Pledge of Allegiance, like what happened to the rest of their lives. And it's really interesting stuff. The Thank book you. is called The Fight for Free Speech. Your website, can you remind? We're going to put yes, it in, it's in the, the comments. Fightforfreespeech.com. Find out more about the book um, and other events that I'll be having uh, at the fightforfreespeech.com. All right. Um, and we're also going to put a link to people uh, having the opportunity to purchase the book. So we're, we're all at home. We've got plenty of time to read. Um, Ian, thank you so much. I also want to thank uh, the Center for Brooklyn History and Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, fascinating conversation. We could have gone on for five more hours, but now we all get to eat. So yes. thank you. Ian Rosenberg. Thank you, John. Thank you, Center for Brooklyn History. I wrote part of this uh, book at the Brooklyn Library, so I I'm delighted to be able to talk with you all today. Good night, everybody. Good night.